from Bright Focus, Dr. Leon Herndon, glaucoma specialist and ophthalmologist at Duke University. Dr. Herndon, welcome. I want to thank Gen Global for hosting and this summit, and the title is Something Old, Something New, Equitable Outreach Strategies to Advance Brain and Vision Health in the Era of COVID-19. My name is Leon Herndon, uh, Chief of Glaucoma at the Duke University Eye Center, and I'm happy to serve as moderator for this uh, panel. I want to um, first give a little overview of a broad introduction to health disparities in my area of expertise, which is glaucoma. I had the distinct honor early in my career to host the late Congressman John Lewis as he received an honorary degree from Duke University. As he was a co-sponsor for the glaucoma screen bill, our department had the opportunity to recognize his efforts. Congressman Lewis was very gracious with his time and it was an honor of a lifetime to be able to spend a few moments with this civil rights icon. First, I wanna talk about definitions. Westers defines disparity as a great difference. It defines equality as the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. Westers defines equity as the quality of being fair and impartial. I borrowed this slide from Lisa Cooper, a great health services researcher at Johns Hopkins, where the cartoon illustrates the fact that some groups may need a boost to achieve health equity, to level the playing field, if you will. In this 2017 Lancet article, Bailey et al. used a contemporary and historical perspective to discuss research and interventions that grapple with the implication of what is known as structural racism on health inequalities. They define structural racism in their paper, uh, referring to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice. The editors of the New England Journal of Medicine uh, featured themselves recently in this editorial criticizing the response of the previous administration to the coronavirus pandemic. And I quote, let's be clear about the cost of not taking even simple measures. An outbreak that has disproportionately affected communities of color has exacerbated the tensions associated with inequality. Lou Freeman and Collins address racial and ethnic disparities in vision care research recently. And the last paragraph of the paper reads, to tackle the elevated burden of eye diseases facing marginalized communities, we need to promise and fulfill our commitment to increase racial and ethnic inclusion in clinical, clinical trials. Without addressing this important issue, we risk perpetuating rather than resolving current health disparities. Progress from investigators and institutions alike will help to alleviate the burden many underserved populations face in ophthalmology and vision care. At this point, I want to introduce Nancy Lynn, Senior Vice President of the Strategic Partnerships with the Bright Focus Foundation. And Bright Focus Foundation supports scientific research to understand and treat Alzheimer's disease, glaucoma, and macular degeneration. The organization currently manages a global portfolio of over 220 projects, a 50 million investment, and has provided over $200 million for research funding overall. Nancy? Thank you so much, Leon. Um, and thanks to IdeaGen and Adriana and George Safakis for, for hosting our, our session, which is focusing on outreach strategies that may be more effective in helping us address these health disparities. And Leon and I both um, work in the area of glaucoma and Bright Focus Foundation um, focuses a lot on Alzheimer's disease. And so I wanted to talk about um, some of the health disparities that are specific to Alzheimer's disease. And then um, where I think we're all, we have been in the past missing the mark in terms of public health and really bringing diverse um, and underserved communities into uh, 
the opportunity to participate in clinical trials and just um, have better, better public health in the face of structural racism and inequities. So I'm bringing up this first slide, um, which is uh, health disparities unique to Alzheimer's disease. And so when we're talking about disparities, um, we're oftentimes talking specifically about race and ethnicity. And in fact, in Alzheimer's, Blacks are two times as likely to contract Alzheimer's disease. Um, and they are diagnosed on average seven years later than whites. Uh, and Latinos are one and a half times as likely to have Alzheimer's. And their symptoms generally appear seven years earlier um, than whites. And uh, Blacks and Latinos have a higher incidence of um, risk factors, comorbidities, uh, such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And um, what's a little unique here, although not entirely unique, because you have this in other diseases as well, but um, women are also um, disproportionately affected by Alzheimer's disease. Two thirds of people with Alzheimer's disease are women, but also two thirds of caregivers for those with Alzheimer's disease are women. So it's a big women's issue. And, um, and of course there's ageism related to um, reimbursement and value assessments in Alzheimer's disease. 80% um, of patients with Alzheimer's disease are, are 75 years of age and over. And so one of the, um, one of the problems with, with these kinds of disparities is, uh, and, the, and there are no, I'll mention no um, disease modifying therapies for Alzheimer's on the market at all. And so, of course, the holy grail of the pharmaceutical industry right now is to develop a disease modifying therapy for um, Alzheimer's disease, many of them, hopefully, um, that will slow the progress of the disease down. But the clinical trials that are being run not only have trouble recruiting in general, but they um, are almost all reflective only all of white educated Americans. And so both scientifically that that is uh, leads to inaccuracies. Um, and of course, uh, it leads to greater uh, inequities. So um, I think um, we are going to be trying to do some outreach that's really a lot more effective and inclusive. And Kaimi and Cornelia, who you're going to meet in a minute, um, are doing this already. Um, and so I wanted to start by showing just a little video clip of the, the way we have typically in the past thought about educating people about Alzheimer's disease um, and, and recruiting for clinical trials. So let's just take a look at a quick video clip. There are a considerable number of studies uh, showing that exercise, physical exercise, makes a big difference. People that are physically active uh, have about a 40 or 50 percent reduced likelihood of coming down with Alzheimer's and, and some of the related dementias. That's a huge effect. Alzheimer's is an old disease, but it's a new disease, too. Uh, we first learned about what's going on in the brain just 100 years ago. There was a, a woman, a patient of uh, Dr. Alzheimer's, when she died at the age of mid fifties. Uh, she, she first came in when she was 40. Um, he looked at her brain and found it was riddled with pathology. Today's topic is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a neurological disorder in which the death of brain cells causes memory loss and cognitive decline. It is the most common type of dementia, accounting for 60 to 80% of cases of dementia in the United States. In the developed nations, the life expectancy has increased. People live longer. And because of that extra years that we are living in the developed nations, there is a higher incidence of Alzheimer. We hear a lot about fear and anxiety and the emotional toll on people with dementia and on their families. But there is good news, and there has been for years. People are sharing the good news about dementia. We all recognize what people with dementia can still do. They can connect with us through music, emotions, and beauty. Thank you, Nancy. I'd like to introduce Cornelia Dorbin, the Project Director for Outreach, Cognitive Neurology, and Movement Disorders Programs at Emory University. Cornelia is a public administration executive who manages projects, 
marketing and outreach initiatives with Gozetta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. She is deeply engaged in a range of efforts that foster exceptional program delivery and stakeholder engagement with patients, families, and the general public. Cornelia? Hello, thank you uh, for that introduction. And uh, thank you on behalf of the Emory Goizetta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, today, I have the privilege of sharing with you uh, how our center has uh, had some success with engaging uh, African-American older adults and caregivers into brain-related research. Um, yes, it is a challenge, as Nancy mentioned, but over the course of <laughs> nearly two decades, uh, we have made uh, a lot of progress. And what I like to say is that, um, you know, this population it is not hard to reach, it's that they are hardly reached. And that's something that we have uh, come to, to know and be aware of over time. Um, and we've made it an intentional and, and purposeful effort uh, through the works of our, our leadership and our coordinators who are really the boots on the ground that uh, are on the front lines to support the research enterprise. And again, uh, we could not do that without people um, participating in research. And so today I want to talk about um, barriers to our research participation. Um, what are those specific strategies and processes uh, that we've implemented? And many of the lessons that we've learned uh, through our community engagement and some of the things we've had to do in this age of COVID. And, and how we've been able to be uh, successful um, in the last uh, 12 months. So um, one thing we, we recognized early on is that um, we needed to uh, build trust in our communities. And that sounds like a very novel, that's easy to do, but um, when, the trust is then eroded and you need to build that up over time, it doesn't happen overnight. And so we have been um, working on this effort um, since two 2005, and it has been an intentional effort um, under the leadership of Dr. Alan Levy, uh, Dr. James Law, and Dr. Monica Parker. And so back in 2005, um, we did receive some additional funding, and that is uh, definitely a requirement when you, you're engaging with people of color. You need money. <laughs> you need money, you need personnel, and you need people who uh, can identify and uh, resonate and who look like the audience you're trying to serve. So as early as 2005, we've been engaged in this effort um, through small grants with many of our community partners. Um, and this effort has really been in collaboration with um, our network of physicians, as well as uh, the Black Church. We are in the heart of the civil rights movement here in Atlanta. And again, it, it's a privilege to uh, work alongside many of the greats, but what we've come to know is it is your uh, health ministries, it is your sororities, um, your uh, ministerial alliances who really are helping to shape and uh, scope the prevent preventive measures that are required for older adults to take charge of their health. And so, uh, as a research center, you know, our job is to ultimately find a cure for memory impairment. And until we do, um, research is our only hope. So we started in 2010 with implementing this a very robust engagement effort with our community partners. So absolutely, we started with uh, focus groups and market research and, you know, bringing them in and, and building a coalition with all of these partners. and. We asked them, you know, what do you want? 
what is important to you? And yes, Alzheimer's is important. Uh, we made them aware of the risk factors. And what we uh, came to know is that they were not aware that, uh, that their vascular issues put them at greater risk for memory impairment. So the outgrowth from that uh, came the Registry for Remembrance. Uh, we refer to it as our RFR. And that's our coalition of African-American partners uh, that make up you know, churches, um, our Black Nurses Network, and uh, many other collaborators who we meet quarterly to begin to um, establish a framework for how we wanna engage people of color. And so our motto is, um, we only go where we're invited. Uh, we only go where we can return because this is a sustained effort. Um, it's not a one-time fit, it's not a one-stop shop, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but um, again, getting people to participate in whether it's an invasive or non-invasive uh, research opportunity, it may not happen one time. It may not happen uh, at the first or third ask. Uh, there are individuals who have been coming to these uh, engage community engagement programs for many years, and they may sign up uh, with the research interest form and say, yeah, I'll do it. And then you call them and they say, ah, I have second thoughts, but you, you don't give up. You don't um, take their maybe not right now as a no. And so again, we go where the community is. Uh, we've again, um, maintained that visibility, sustained it through ongoing engagement. Uh, there are many many um, entities where we go every year and they expect us to be there. So our visibility is high, our engagement is purposeful, and it's definitely a pro-health message. We want um, people of color to age well. We want them to understand um, what questions to ask as a research participant. So um, when COVID came about, um, you know, the in-person opportunity went away. So we were accustomed to hosting 30 to 40 programs a year in person with anywhere from 50 people up to over a thousand. And these programs could last two hours or as long as four hours. And so um, from 2010 up until last year, that's what we have been doing. Um, and that has helped our research and engagement grow from uh, 8% African-American participation all the way up to 33%. And so our goal by the end of our, our funding cycle is hopefully to be at a 50% uh, representation and enrollment for our longitudinal cohort, which is pretty uh, aggressive, <laughs> right? But um, as I said, the in-person opportunity, you know, we had to sort of shut down like everyone um, did in, in the country. And so uh, after about a week of us sort of like wondering, okay, we cannot do this uh, level of engagement, this, this intense, meaningful, purposeful engagement uh, right now. So how do we keep individuals uh, engaged? How do we keep them empowered? How do we keep them in the know, right? Um, so Emory had already been using Zoom, so we were very much familiar with it, and Zoom took off, as, as we know. It became, you know, your go-to uh, platform to, to stay connected and to uh, conduct your online class or, you know, attend sew sewing or birthday parties, right? So after about, you know, a week in March of last year, we discovered uh, let's take our in-person programs virtually. And um, our outreach recruitment and engagement core, you know, we, we had a couple of meetings, we did a survey uh, to assess to our, you know, potential viewers, what is the most ideal time? What do you want to hear? What do you want to know about? And um, one thing that we've always done when we have been in person is we 
have begun all of our programs with exercise because we know the benefits of exercise and we know that it's neuroprotective. And during the, the isolation and the lockdown, you know, people were being very, very sedentary. So uh, we developed a, um, a model where we would host this one hour program every Tuesday. And we would, again, kick off with exercise. And so you're going to see a clip here where <laughs> John Lewis um, actually exudes this contagious energy <laughs> that he has all bottled up through the screen. So we kick that off with our program for about um, six to 10 minutes. And then we dive right into this content around being a healthy older adult and addressing those risk factors for African-Americans. We feature typically a research project and, and definitely something around caregiving because we know at least 30% of our viewers are caregivers. And we close with a feature of our healthy aging study, which is just sort of what we like to call um, a gateway study. You can do it online um, from anywhere in your home online. And so um, those are sort of the components of our weekly session titled Emory Brain Talk Live. But in the age of COVID, uh, we, we have to sustain our engagement. We have to keep African-Americans informed. And if they're already participating in research, we want them to stay connected. Um, if they're on the fence, we want to continue to build trust. And by them seeing us every week and every week since March 31st of 2020, we've been hosting these programs where, you know, anywhere from, you know, 150 to 300 people from all over the world actually um, engage. And so that is sort of the benefit as well of, um, having this virtual uh, platform, we've been able to you know, reach people that we haven't been able to reach before. And again, until there's a cure, you know, research is our only hope. And so that is what we know is that um, African-Americans, they want to be engaged, they want to be informed, uh, they want to be a part of research so that it will benefit the next generation. And so, as I said, until um, there are other opportunities for prevention or until, until a new intervention or drug uh, or cure, we hope, comes online, we will continue to engage African-Americans until every older adult is aware of all the research opportunities that they can participate in. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to John because what do we say every week? What's good for your heart is good for your brain. So John's going to come on for about 10 minutes and get our hearts going and get us pumping and exude all that energy to, through the screen for us. And then we'll turn it over to our formal speaking speakers and then um, sign off. And then you can sign on to the Cognitive Empowerment Program if you choose. Okay. Hi, John. Hey. Hey. It's a new year. Make sure you have a sturdy chair. And today, we're going to keep it very, very simple. We're going to warm up real good. So go get that chair. First of all, I want to welcome everybody to the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And it's going to be a great year. Here we go. Let's warm up. Legs wide. We're going to stretch a little bit. And over. Other side. We're offering a variety of programming, but we love it when you join us here every week for Brain Talk Live. So, Dr. Parker, welcome. Hello. I'm turning the floor over to you so you can answer all these hot questions. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to do so. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you again for joining us on our Brain Talk Live. I mean, somebody needs to give us a real award for making sure that you show up on time every weekend. Kudos to Cornelia for keeping us moving and keeping us motivated. Thank you uh, so much, Cornelia. I love the video. I, I have a sturdy chair, and I'm getting ready to do my exercises now. I, I do have uh, I do have two questions for you, Cornelia. Um, outstanding initiatives that uh, you've established there in Atlanta. 
Uh, what do you think are the main reasons behind the reluctance of African Americans to be involved with uh, with research? Well, I what we established early on is that they were not aware that these opportunities existed. And so that has been part of our formula is going into the community and exposing them and uh, heightening their awareness. You know, we think in this age of the 21st century and all the software and technology that, you know, all of this stuff is accessible. It is not. And so I, if I had a dollar for every time they said, why didn't I know, or that, 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 no one told me, or why did my doctor tell me that if I uh, managed my diabetes, if I monitored my blood pressure, if I, you know, ate better, I would reduce my risk for Alzheimer's. And so when we are educating them, they're now more informed and empowered. And knowing that there is a research available to them that can um, guide them, inform them, they're more apt to participate. I learned something from Nancy's talk about the fact that underrepresented minorities are more highly represented, higher incidence of Alzheimer's uh, than, than the majority of population. Uh, so last question, Cornelia, what in your two decades of this program being in place, have, have you seen what parameters have improved? Uh, what measures have you uh, been proud of with the increase in the uh, efforts of uh, research involvement? Uh, I think just our community, they, uh, when you go through sort of the traditional and non-traditional uh, strategies for research, you know, recruitment and engagement, I mean, you know, people, some people have these huge marketing campaigns and, uh, you know, millions of dollars or hundreds of dollars. And, you know, what we have come to know is that uh, word of mouth, <laughs> so people having a good, a good research experience uh, when they come into a clinic. Uh, is our biggest uh, referral and our community events. They expect us. They want to see us. They demand <laughs> for us to come into their communities and uh, we're sort of on their calendar year to year. And uh, that has been the most surprising and, and rewarding thing to have this established uh, relationship with our community. Well, thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to introduce Kaimi Sinclair. She's an associate professor, Institute for Research and Education to Advance Community Health, College of Nursing, Washington State University. As a researcher, Kaimi works with underserved communities to reduce cardiometabolic disparities. For more than two decades, Dr. Sinclair has developed, implemented, and evaluated culturally adapted interventions to promote health and prevent disease with several health disparity populations including American Indians across the United States, African Americans and Latinos in Detroit, and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in Hawaii and Washington. Welcome, Dr. Sinclair. Thank you. Thank you, Leon, for the introduction. And thank you, Idea Jen, for hosting this timely panel. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, and I appreciate the, um, the invitation. Well, I, as, as Leah mentioned, I have worked with many different um, health disparity populations. Um, my work now focuses on American Indians across the country. We work with tribal communities, with urban natives, and I also work with Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Uh, so I, I moved to Seattle from Hawaii, and uh, when I moved to Seattle, I looked through the literature and I learned that nobody was including Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in research here in Washington, uh, where the third largest population of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders live um, beside, after California and Hawaii. So I started reaching out to organizations uh, that serve Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and uh, started building a community academic partnership. And as uh, Cornelia mentioned, you know, it, it takes a long time to build trust with these communities. And, um, and, and part of my work too has been to help people become better consumers of research so that people understand what they're getting into <laughs> when they sign up for a research project. And, uh, you know, we've learned by enrolling uh, individuals from these communities 
uh, and you know reviewing the consent form with them. And in many people, you know, their first language is not English. And so, you know, we had to develop new strategies to uh, effectively um, describe the intervention or the research that they'd participate in. And part of that has been media as well. So we've developed um, digital stories and other kinds of media to help people better understand the research process and the research project that they may be enrolling in. And many of the things that um, Cornelia mentioned, you know, are echoed in American Indian and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities too. Um, you know, historical and research, recent research abuses uh, affect the willingness of people in these communities to participate in research. Um, and anyone who does community engaged research like we do understands that you know, there are many other things that are of concern <laughs> to these communities and participating in research may not be um, a priority for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we always work to find out what their priorities are. And, you know, particularly during, you know, the pandemic, when we haven't been able to, you know, work in person with uh, these communities, we have tried to work with our community organizations and contribute to helping these communities who, um, you know, through the food distributions, uh, through vaccine clinics. Um, so any support that we can offer uh, for communities to help them get through this pandemic. Um, and as you know, they, our communities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 as well. Um, we have tried to engage in, and, and I think this is the perfect time to uh, build even more trust with our communities and partnerships with these communities, um, because now is, is the time you know, of giving and contributing to the health and well-being of the communities you know, outside of research. Um, we have done some listening sessions or focus groups via Zoom and engaged with folks around vaccine hesitancy um, and other issues and, and Alzheimer's disease and willingness to participate in clinical trials and the Alzheimer's uh, Disease Research Center um, uh, Clinical Research Core. And, um, you know, it offers a time where people can ask questions as well about these different topics and, and talk with each other um, and hear from experts on these topics. Uh, so we've done some of those and, you know, we already had several research projects going before COVID, which had been in person and pretty intense interventions that were in person. But after COVID, well, when COVID hit, of course, all of that in-person contact um, ceased. And I think being researchers, we, we're also um, clever in thinking of new ways we adapt. Um, and we have to because we can't just stop doing our work. So we, you know, pivoted like many others did to online um, Zoom delivered uh, interventions. We do all the data collection via Zoom. And as Cornelia mentioned, it offered the opportunity to reach people that we may not have reached in doing an in-person um, intervention or in-person research. So it's really, we've learned a lot <laughs> using this method and able, you know, we're able to recruit people from across the country, which we hadn't been doing before because you can't do that when you're doing this in person and um, reached so many more people and learned that, um, you know, people find a way, uh, even though, you know, we know many communities are not um, able to access technology as much as people that might live in cities and um, other areas where uh, you know Wi-Fi is more available. Um, but we but we know now that more than seventy percent of American Indians live in urban centers. So through our through Facebook and other um, recruitment tools, we have recruited many more participants than we were in person. Um, so I think, you know, this has shown a light on new ways to do things that we may not have even tried before. 
so it's been really exciting and and even in collecting survey information survey data from different populations we've um, had a lot more participation in those unfortunately for many of our elders who do not have access um, to technology to be able to participate in um, you know some of the webinars that have uh, that we've had or listening sessions um, that has been an issue and they can't you know gather anymore in places where they could participate in some of these um, these uh, activities so we have had to wait and you know since our communities have been um, particularly affected by COVID-19, many of the tribal communities pretty much shut their borders. They closed their borders. Um, nobody was allowed in. Um, and then, it, you know, it made it difficult to even communicate them, communicate with them uh, via telephone um, or, or Zoom. So we have been waiting to uh, engage with our elders again. We, as I mentioned, we keep um, engaging with our community partners uh, through newsletters and um, other methods uh, so that they know that we're still here. Uh, we are invested in their communities. And, um, you know, when, when we're able to get back in person again, we will be able to do that. But uh, I think this has been a particularly um, insightful time for many reasons. Um, but it, especially in identifying new strategies or other strategies that we may not have um, tested or evaluated before, before COVID hit. Everything we ordered was through catalogs, including our groceries. We had a big form we had to fill out and you checked off what you wanted. You had to fill in your name and everything. And I noticed my mom really struggled to fill in all of that. Just her information, her name, her age, the address. You could see where she crossed out or erased several times because she had written something incorrectly. And I'm going, something's, something's not right here. I thought that it was just natural aging. I didn't know there was more to it. There is an emerging robust science that links obesity and diabetes to the development of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So moving, hiking, dancing, um, these are things that really help protect you. And we can look to our traditional foods um, as examples of how we should be eating. We can learn new things, um, things that are difficult to learn, like our native languages. Um, this kind of stuff develops a cognitive reserve so that um, you have more neuro connections and you're better able to um, manage the impact of Alzheimer's disease in your day-to-day -day life. We want, we want to thank you for those comments and enjoy the video that, uh, that you shared. I've got a question for Cornelia and Kaimi. So, we're learning to do different things now because of COVID, but there've been some positives, if you will, that have come out of the education piece uh, with COVID. What are some of the things, uh, Cornelia, that you think you'll take from COVID and continue uh, uh, beyond COVID? Well, one thing that the viewers have made it clear to us is that even if we, when we return to in-person, which we hope in the next uh, several weeks will ramp up and things will open up. They have told us do not stop <laughs> the virtual session. So um, that will be a challenge because putting on a, you know, a one hour program with, you know, speakers and hosts and panelists and, you know, coordinating an exercise session every week is, it's a big undertaking along with the in-person. So I have been very pleased with just the level of engagement. So we do a poll uh, right before the uh, program and then a post event survey of, you know, what did you learn? Are you implementing this information? How many programs have you attended? And over 60% of the viewers have attended at least five programs uh, since the course of our virtual engagement. And so for the average age of participants is 68. And so they have definitely had to adopt this technology and they've embraced it. We've had technical assistance uh, 
sessions with them. And uh, so it has been encouraging to see them uh, come alive and say, you know, this is the only exercise I get. Or thank you so much for these sessions. And or, you know, now that I know what to ask my doctor, I'm informed. So they're kind of almost informing the doctor sometimes of, of what their needs are. So I, we've just, it's been, you know, it's been bittersweet. Yeah, I mean, what will you take from, uh, from COVID? Well, I have um, the first ever clinical trial funded by NIH that exclusively recruits American Indian men for a lifestyle um, intervention. And before COVID, it was all in person in uh, two different sites. And it was extremely difficult recruiting American Indian men. And we know that men don't participate in interventions as much as women do. Um, but we, had, we recruited about 100 men, but it took almost three years to recruit them and get them to come to classes. So when COVID uh, came along, we, as I mentioned, we switched everything to online through Zoom and started recruiting across the country. And we recruited almost 200 men in six months for the program. And we've had great participation because they can just join the classes from their living room. So, you know, before COVID, I wouldn't have even thought to uh, test or evaluate a program like this online. But I have learned that it does work. And for this particular population, it, it works very well. Um, and so I'm excited to be able to continue uh, offering this online online interventions. Um, and we have another program for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and hypertension management that we're changing to all online too. So we'll, we'll see how many people we can reach that way. So it's something that I hope to continue after COVID. That's great. Nancy, I have a question for you. How is uh, Bright Focus uh, addressing outreach now? And what are some of the unique strategies that you're using in the post-COVID era? Well, I have to say, we're gonna steal as much as we can from <laughs> Cornelia and Kaimi. Cornelia and Kaimi are my sheroes. And uh, one of the things that we haven't touched upon, but um, that got me going and Bright Focus going on, on down a path that I'll talk about in a minute, is um, that um, Cornelia, um, people are very isolated, especially during COVID, especially older people, really isolated. And Cornelia, I, I, I've been an admirer of Cornelia's program since since I think it started online. And she did a, um, a Christmas broadcast um, where the exercise guy, whose name also is John Lewis, dressed up as the Grinch, and he did the exercises in a Grinch outfit, and everybody was participating, wore Christmas costumes and so on. And and she brought everybody who was on the session on. They could all see each other's faces. And I talked to her after that, and Cornelia, you, you made a comment that really stuck with me, that somebody called you, an older person called you, and asked if you would do another one of these on New Year's Eve, because this was how they were celebrating Christmas. You, you know, I think you and, and Emery had, had become a friend to them that goes into their home and reaches them uh, in their home with fun and engaging and understandable and worthwhile information. Um, so what Bright Focus is doing, um, thank you, Leon, is trying to take this content that people like Cornelia and Kaimi and their institutions are creating and um, that filmmakers are creating. There's a whole bunch of wonderful Alzheimer's films out this year, The Father and um, Supernova and a whole bunch. And, uh, and there are many in different languages from different countries and uh, TV shows and books, Still Alice. And, and um, unfortunately, a lot of the academic institutions or associations are will create content for their local community and then it's used once and it goes away. And so we started to think that this con all of this content should be leveraged um, to really be more engaging for people. I think um, 
Cornelia, you said keeping people in the know. And Kaimi, you said it's a time of giving to people. When a lot of times when scientists and recruiters talk about trying to recruit for trials, they that's what they're talking about trying to recruit. They're, and and I was working with um, Gates Ventures, IQVIA, and USC who put out a white paper that said 99% of potential clinical trial participants never even enter the funnel because they just don't know. It's what Cornelia said. They just don't have the information. They don't know. And um, so we're creating, and I'll put a slide up here. Um, we've just gotten funding, like Cornelia said, that's the important part. Um, we're creating a virtual community outreach series. Um, which, and the subtitle for that is Bringing a Sustained Alzheimer's Education Campaign to Clinical Research Centers Across the U.S. and Addressing Equity, Diversity, and Health Disparities. It's a very academic title. Um, it will be called something like Cornelia's Brain Talk Live, something along those lines. Um, but our proposed solution here is to um, push out more engaging, entertaining content maybe once or twice a month, sustained, as, as Cornelia mentioned, that is concordant, to use one of Leon's words, concordant with the communities receiving the information. So we're gonna work not only with the trial sites, but with local community leaders, senior living centers, um, and, and engage with people who will join the broadcasts who are from the community and can speak to the community in their language, literally um, and figuratively. And um, so I just put a little photo montage on this slide here of the, we can use Cornelia's uh, content and Los Angeles's content, but also, um, and certainly Kayumi's content, but also um, movies there's, um, and books and, and so on and create little, little productions. And so on the next slide, I've just got a little, it's a boring old style slide um, that, this is going to be a multi-sector collaboration. It involves government, industry, the entertainment, Hollywood Health and Society, Motion Picture and Television Fund, um, all the different oh. academic institutions and Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers, our, our sister nonprofits and communities. Um, and we'll develop these 30 to 45 minute presentations, just giving information basic information about Alzheimer's disease, not just saying, please join our, our research study. Um, and we're gonna do a 12 to 24 month pilot and, and then take the programs that we produce and the content that people are willing to share and create an open source repository of this con content so that it can be leveraged and everybody can use it. And it's in different languages and it can reach different communities. And, and so the idea really is, again, um, especially during COVID, when people are isolated and not receiving, the Alzheimer's space is very, very complicated. It's a really complex disease. And thanks to a lot of increased funding at the government level and, and from nonprofits and the, and the private sector, um, there's suddenly some real hope and activity. There may be a blood test that can diagnose Alzheimer's digital wearables that can help diagnose it. And there are some potentially effective disease modifying treatments on the horizon, as well as um, uh, both other guests were saying, lifestyle interventions, diet, exercise, stop smoking, um, keep your brain engaged. So um, we're really excited and not, uh, we can show a little video clip um, just of a couple of, uh, a movie and a TV show, um, you can imagine broadcasting with a host and then having a discussion around. Um, so that's that's what Bright Focus will be will be working on uh, very intensely alongside of all of its research funding. This is your brain. Wow. We're looking at this region of the brain. Oh. Because that's the part of the brain, among others that's involved hmm. with memory. Well, that butterfly in there on purpose? The, the butterfly is sort of water space in the brain, <laughs> okay. okay? It's like where ventricles, where the fluid yeah, is, the spinal fluid is, okay? This indicates that in all likelihood, your difficulties are due to Alzheimer's disease. When I asked you to repeat the three words back to me, 
You said pool instead of spoon. I asked you to identify my stethoscope. It took you a while to find the word. What the hell do any of you know? You work in the hospital all day around sick people and disease? You're obsessed. That's what this is. So I got a few answers wrong. That's all? It's normal to forget things at my age. You can never remember where you parked the car whenever we go to the movies and they're not saying that you have. It's not fair. Thank you, Nancy. And as an ophthalmologist, I'm, I'm proud to say that even an eye examination may help one day to uh, diagnose Alzheimer's from uh, the characteristic findings of the, of the retina. So really exciting. Well, and exciting and I did forget to say that Leon and I are plotting to uh, ultimately, once this sort of communication network across the U.S. is established, to start including uh, information on vision health and how to care for your vision and the eye and the brain are connected and, you know, and hopefully d deliver other public health information as well. So this has been a great session. One thing that uh, I'm taking from this is that we need to continue our efforts with disseminating uh, awareness. Uh, there's so much uh, that is not known by the public. And, and once we can get these uh, issues out and the resources out to the community, then we'll have better involvement. And, and can I add too, I think engagement with the community too. Um, so not just getting information out there, but engagement like Cornelia mentioned and that they do too. Um, we cannot sit back and wait for them to come to us because they won't. <laughs> you have to get out there and you have to show them that you have their interests at heart as well. Cornelia, I'll let you have the last word. I, I think until there's a cure, it's critical to highlight the work around research and know that that is our hope and that all communities must be engaged and you need to have a by any means necessary approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank George and Adriana Safakis and IDIGEN Global for organizing this great session and thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.